Hey developers, can you get a job after learning to code for three months? Is that even possible nowadays? So in this video, I'm going to look at how one person did it, Coding Jesus, and see if what he did is reproducible by all of us. And so I'm going to take a look at this video, I'm going to give you my perspective on learning to code in three months, and see if something like this can be reproduced. Yeah, so let's just jump on into it. If you want to check out his video, I'll make sure the link is in the description. Yeah, I want to see how you can do this, how you can learn to code in in three months. Hey guys, so today I'm going to be sharing with you my three to four month journey as to how I learned to code and landed several job offers after doing so. Okay, so I'm going to speak about how I learned to code in kind of the second half of this video, but the first bit is giving you guys a little bit of my background, who I am as an individual, my education, my job, my previous job experience before learning how to code, etc. So I grew up in a quite modest environment. I mean, my, both my parents are immigrants. My dad's a software engineer and my mom is an artist. Now I know you're probably saying, okay, his dad's a software engineer, he's a coding prodigy. That's not the case at all. My dad always tried to teach me how to code. I never gave it much thought. I always said, I don't care for it. You know, having any sort of background, uh, family members that are in the industry that have done computer science or have taught or are actual programmers, I think that's gonna rub off on you somehow. I know he's saying it didn't influence at all, but I've been in, I've seen a lot of households where you just kind of learn about the industry just because you live with someone that's doing it. You at least hear like, well, I can't talk to you right now. I'm in the middle of a, uh, a meeting or a scrum meeting or I'm, I'm doing my daily standup. So I think you do learn a little bit. I'm surprised he didn't learn anything that his dad didn't teach him how to program, but well, we'll take it for what it is. Okay, so what about university? Well, I come from a business background as in I have a business degree. Now, thank God for me in my last year of university, I gained a very strong interest in cryptocurrency, and that interest took me to a cryptocurrency exchange that operations are run out of Hong Kong. During my time at this company, I wanted to differentiate myself from other new joiners of the company, other new graduates. So how did I go about doing so? Well, the company uses a very proprietary language called KDB developed by KX Systems. Now, my friends didn't know what this language was, the other graduates of this company didn't know what the language was. And so I felt it would be less intimidating for me to learn this language. And so I felt as though if I learned KDB, maybe a little syntax here, a little syntax there, maybe write a little program internally, then that might differentiate with me, differentiate me not only with the other graduates, but also with my friend groups. So at first this makes me feel like this is not the typical self-taught journey or learning to code in three months that I've heard in the past where someone literally has not gone to college. They're, they're basically teaching themselves from scratch, learning how to program. They don't come from a coding bootcamp. So I feel like right away, like this isn't the typical story and trying to learn a, like a very esoteric programming language, I think right away kind of sends me to, to feel like this, this, this isn't normal. Let's see what he does with it. And slowly but surely, I started taking on more and more coding related tasks as I started reading more and more into the KDB documentation. Now that ended up leading to me collaborating with a senior KDB developer to develop an open source project or build on an open source project called Q Explorer. But that might be a video or a story for another day that's not relevant. Wait, wait, wait. So you actually are contributing to an open source project, working with a senior developer on this KDB. This is not really what I consider self-taught already because you're getting help at your work. You're kind of learning on the job. You're getting kind of mentorship from a senior developer. And he hasn't even gone into graduating college and trying to get his first job. So this doesn't feel like a self-taught journey for me. What's relevant is this. I felt that I wanted to take on more and more coding related tasks and I slowly but surely seeped that idea into other members of this organization. Now, unfortunately, that didn't work out too well because of bureaucracy, something I can't control. I wasn't able to land myself after this graduate program onto a coding-based position, and so I decided to simply leave this company. You know, that's happens. it happened to me too. As an undergrad, I was working for a company doing software development, and I couldn't transition from that position after I graduated college to actually have a full-time position there at that job. Uh, so, so once again, he's definitely getting a lot of experience, getting his college degree and learning how to job at the same time. Very different than most self-taught journeys, but I think this is really common. Uh, the job that you get in college isn't necessarily the one you're gonna keep outside of college. So Tomer, coding Jesus, how did you figure out or how did you teach yourself how to code? There are really four things that I did. Books, videos, lead code problems, and pet projects. Yeah, those are four great ways of learning, being self-taught. Obviously, working at a company that teaches at the same time would be his fifth that he doesn't mention here. Certainly, we're learning from books. I know some developers have already shunned books. They don't buy books at all. The only 
things they do is read blogs and videos on YouTube and other places. But I, I, I have a place for books in my heart. You know, I actually wrote a book. So I think books are still a great place to learn. Lee Code, I want to get back to this because I want to see what he says about it. And then Pet Projects, I agree. Uh, but I think there's other ways to do it. Learn, learn, practice, apply. Okay, now how did I do so? And how did I pick which language I want to learn? Right, that's the beginning of the self-taught journey. So what I did was this. I asked myself, what do I like? Well, I like finance. I still have an interest in finance and I have previous experience at a cryptocurrency exchange. I don't want to become a front end developer. That's boring. I don't care about creating websites. I don't care about making buttons nice and writing 300 page documentation as to why a button should be moved one pixel over. Wait, 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 wait. 300 pages in documentation. Uh, I don't think that's what uh, software developers do. That's not for me. What I feel, what I end up doing is doing research as to which languages are used in backend applications in the finance industry. And what I realized is that C++ is a gold standard for the finance industry. And a pretty interesting discipline in the finance industry is high frequency trading. So I told myself, why don't I pick up a book and see if I like C++? So that was my first step. Locked myself in a room for 10 to 12 hours a day and read a book, a 300 to 400 page book on C++. Okay, so right away, this kind of strikes me as the hard mode in life. Uh, C, C++ is, uh, I would say, one of the more difficult programming languages to learn, especially if this is your first language and you're trying to teach yourself to code in three months. 99% of the time I see people learning JavaScript, like that's probably the first one because the JavaScript HTML CSS route seems to be where way more self-taught developers, way more people getting to programming development start off with because uh, it's really easy to create, like you can create a really nice website with not a ton of knowledge. You can even import in or use other people's HTML, CSS. You can go to every website on the internet, right click on view source to kind of get an idea of how it works. Well, on C C++, you are very limited. And unless you're trying to get into like the graphical libraries, you're gonna be stuck with just like text on the screen. It's just gonna be really hard. And plus, usually with C C++, uh, especially C++, you have this object-oriented program you're gonna have to learn. So you're gonna have to learn classes. You're gonna have to learn about pointers. I've read those 300 page books and they're pretty dense, but this is almost like what you would see in an old school computer science curriculum at a university. They usually, a lot of them, still some old school ones still use C++ as the language they teach their students. So this this would be my first like thing. I wouldn't reproduce this. Like most people probably shouldn't learn C++ as their first language. It's just gonna be way too difficult for them. He is right in what he says about, you know, finance using these low level languages like C++, that's typically, you might see something like this. You might also even see even older languages in finance for companies and banks that haven't moved over to modern programming languages. And also if you're doing like embedded development, I've seen that a lot using C++. So what did I do next? Well, you can only read books before for so long before your, your mind just melts and it doesn't absorb as much knowledge as, as you'd like. So what I decided to do is mix up my reading regime with a regime of watching videos. Now I decided to subscribe to Pluralsight. I consider it a more legit Udemy and Pluralsight offers you learning paths you can go down. So I like C++ and I decided to do the learning path, the C++ learning path on Pluralsight. And moving from those beginner videos to intermediate videos to advanced videos while still having books by my side and reading through maybe 100 pages a day, doing 10 to 12 hours a day, no weekends. I mean, that's pretty intense, 10 to 12 hours a day. Once again, I would see most people would like burn out on that type of schedule in like, I don't know, a week or two. But if you're super dedicated, I could see maybe trying to get it done in two or doing that many and trying to cram it all in because you're trying to get this job right away. I 100% agree with him on like Pluralsight and Udemy and then mixing in, you know, reading and visual learning. I think that's a great way to learn is just trying to get different mediums, trying to focus not just on reading, but also watching videos. And then I'm sure he'll talk about actually doing things too with his pet projects, which I think is also a really important part of learning a new language. Once again, I would say my advice to people trying to learn, first, I think three months is way too, too short of a period. Mine would be try to stick with a schedule, try to do something, some of the things that you might see in this book, like Atomic Habits, where you try to create a habit of learning every day, maybe set a specific time, and maybe even place or ritual that you have every day while you're trying to learn. Rather than trying to cram 10 hours in, maybe try to start off one hour a day or two hours a day and try to keep up with that and then increase as you can. Now at around, at around the two month mark, I committed myself to starting to interview. 
Now, to interview, you need to understand data structures and algorithms. So to apply the knowledge that I learned through data structure and algorithms books, what I did was lead code problems. What every computer science graduate does, what every bootcamp graduate does, lead code problems. And I, I don't agree with this because after two months, like once again, most people are, are just barely learning the concepts and to try to get into lead code is gonna be super diffi duper difficult. And it is true, most CS curriculums have data structure classes and they also have classes where you learn algorithms. Those sometimes are combined into one class, sometimes they're separate classes. Those classes are done and taught over a whole semester and they're usually senior level type classes after you've already done three years of undergrad. And then also Lead Code is something you usually get in your bootcamp program after usually the last few weeks of the of the boot camp and usually those boot camps last more than two months and if they're in two months it's a lot different environment than trying to self-teach yourself for two months unless you're going for a very large company that asks these type questions like the amazon or facebook or netflix or something like that you're probably better off just working on your portfolio and making sure that's up to snuff and being able to answer some of those basic questions that you get during interviews like can you reverse a linked list? Can you reverse a string? And rather than trying to do all these algorithm type questions, which are gonna be extremely difficult, especially if you just started learning to program. Now guys, I remember doing one lead code problem a day, taking an hour on a lead code problem. Even the easy problems, I said, this is so hard, I can't do it. It's still hard for even senior developers. If you've been in the industry for a while and then going back and learning lead code type problems, those heavy uh, algorithm type problems, they're gonna be really hard for most people. Like I said, this is really, this is like super hard mode for new developers. But I just ended up pushing through them. But eventually I started pushing lead code more and more into my routine and pushing back or pulling back a bit on books more and more because I wanted to have a split of let's say 50% learning, 50% lead code by the time I start interviewing. I would say 50% learning is perfect, but 50% like pet projects is what I would do. I would skip the lead code, maybe just looking at a few problems. Honestly, I, I think most companies won't even give you an interview that would ask those type of questions, especially if you're completely self-taught and you don't have a any sort of degree. So what did I do to land now interviews? So I have some knowledge. How did I go about knowing I was ready to interview and how did I land and succeed at those interviews? Okay, so how do you know you're ready? You don't. You're never ready, guys. You never are ready to interview. And that's the whole point of interviewing. It's to get your feet wet to understand what you do well and what you do poorly in. I 100% agree with that. Like you should always just jump in to the interviews. You're never gonna feel like you have enough knowledge or you're ready, so I would say jump in, start getting your feet wet, trying to get interviews with as many people as you can. Now, I don't think you should do that after one month of learning to code or two months. I'd say at least get a little bit more of a foundation down, but then I would always, uh, I would always err on the side of just doing more interviews and trying. Now, what I suggest is interview at companies you don't want to actually get a position at first so that you can see how the interview process works, you can get your feet wet, you can be less nervous, such that when you interview with the companies you wanna work at, you already understand how the process works and you're more comfortable. I've heard this advice a few times from a few different people, like you should just interview places you don't want. I don't really love that advice. I think it's better to interview places you do wanna be at or places that are like your lukewarm medium, but you should never apply for a place you don't wanna go for. I think it's just dishonest, like I don't, feel like you should go through the interview process at a place that you don't want to go be at at all. Cause then it feels like if you do get the offer, then you have to like, it's a big waste of time for them. And I, I just don't like it. I, I feel like at least interview places that you are somewhat interested in. Now, a big part of interviewing is not only the algorithmic problems, you should be comfortable doing those via the lead code regime that you've implemented into your daily routine, but how you differentiate yourself as a self-taught developer against computer science graduates and against boot campers. You need to now differentiate yourself in terms of what do you do that these people don't, okay? So what did I do? This is a story about me, my journey, what did I do? So I built up a portfolio of pet projects. Believe it or not, many boot campers and many computer science graduates do not have a portfolio of pet projects. Yeah, this is true. Like I 100% behind the pet projects idea, creating a portfolio of trying to show what you can do is, is a great way of getting your name above the rest or get your application the top of the pile, so to speak. I also think there's a whole bunch of other things you can do of having an, a very solid resume. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. I think portfolio is just one of 
one thing you could do. I think there's many other things you can do to get your name at the top, especially if you're self-taught and you don't have any work experience, you don't have a boot camp, you don't have a CS degree. And fortunately, having a CS degree or having being a boot camp grad is sort of a cheat code. It's sort of an unfair advantage for people looking for developer jobs. A lot of companies will look at a CS grad or someone with at least A education or they'll look for a prestigious or well-known boot camp and that will really will help them will help get through the recruiter to actually get a phone call with somebody so having something that kind of catches the recruiter's eye that gets past hr so you can get an interview really helps so what were my pet projects well i have three pet projects the first one is i developed an algorithm to crack a jane street puzzle now if you don't know what jane street puzzles are you can go google it in general, they are very well known in the finance stream, the stream that I wanted to get into, and they are puzzles that people spend a bunch of time trying to crack. There are thousands of applicants, and maybe only 40 people get their name on the leaderboard and actually end up cracking the puzzle. That, that's really insane and good for this guy, Mr. Coding Jesus, for doing this. But I, uh, once again, like I've heard of portfolio projects like creating personal blogs, creating games is really popular, and a lot of people do it. I've never heard of like a finance industry app. I, I think that would definitely uh, make you stand out though. Okay, the second thing I did was I built a 2D platformer using a C++ library or a framework, whatever you want to call it. And I think the framework was called S SFML. I think that's what it's called, I may be wrong. But I built a 2D platformer called Cave Story. Or I didn't build it, I recreated it. So I rebuilt it. Um, and that was very interesting. I mean, it was an adventure for me because I saw how I can apply C++ concepts to make things move on my screen. Yeah, I think games are great portfolio pieces. I, I am not super familiar with the C++ ecosystem and all the game libraries for it, but that, that, I mean, that is pretty, pretty awesome that he was able to learn that and, and get something visual. Because most of the time when I was working with C++, I was just working with ugly command line program. And that's about it, guys. That is my journey. Their journey was books. Their journey was videos. The journey included a bunch of lead code problems and slowly but surely integrating more and more lead code problems. And the last would be pet projects. So overall, I'm really impressed by Coding Jesus here. He took on C++, which is one of the hardest programming languages you can learn when you're first starting to program. In two months, he started doing lead code type problems, which once again is really advanced. And if you just learned algorithms and data structures and trying to apply that, I'd say most people would be completely lost in it. He also was able to create three pretty advanced pet projects, which really impressed his employers. So I would say overall, like kudos for him being able to do that all in three months and being able to land a pretty good offer, which he didn't really mention the offers, but I'm guessing he, he got a job at a big fang type company after all of this. But I would certainly say in the aspect of trying to reproduce what he's doing, I would say the specifics I, w I would not do. I would not try to learn C++ as my first language. I would probably, use uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. I probably wouldn't go into leak code right away after two months. I'd probably wait on that or try to find a place that would allow me to come in as a junior developer without having to do that. I would also try to space out my learning instead of doing 10 to 12 hours a day, which I think when most people would get burned out on, I would try to maybe I try to do like two hours a day and then try to build up from there, maybe try three or four during the weekends, something that way I don't get frustrated with it. And also, he didn't mention this, but I'm sure like whole communities exist for this type of thing. Like Free Code Camp would be a perfect one. There's a lot of Discord channels. Uh, there's a lot of r other courses. All he mentioned was Pluralsight, but I think there's just really great courses. There's a lot of resources out there. And I think having like a coding buddy to at some point would be even more helpful, like a group to, to help you along. So I'd say the ideas of trying to learn and try to create pet projects, try to do. Those are all great ideas. I just think the specifics of what he did isn't something typical, but that was his journey. So that, that's how he made it. I don't know, what do you guys think about his journey? I definitely shared my views. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks and I appreciate it.